Section 17 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett Shannock the Last, Part 5 Darkness He was lost in it, and he was not himself any more. He fled through the darkness, groping, crying out for something that was gone. And a voice answered him, a voice that he did not want to hear. Darkness. Dreams. Dawn high on the blazing mountains he stood in the city watching the light glow bright and pitiless watching it burn on the upper walls and then slip downward into the streets casting heavy shadows in the openings of door and window so that the houses looked like skulls with empty eye holes and gaping mouths the buildings no longer seemed too big he walked between them and when he came to steps he climbed them easily and the window ledges were no higher than his head. He knew these buildings. He looked at each one as he passed, naming it, remembering with a long, long memory. The hawks came down to him, the faithful servants with the sunstones in their brows. He stroked their pliant necks, and they hissed softly with pleasure, but their shallow minds were empty of everything but that vague sensation. He passed on through the familiar streets, and in them nothing stirred. All through the day from dawn to sunset, and in the darkness that came afterward, nothing stirred, and there was a silence among the stones. He could not endure the city. His time was not yet, though the first subtle signs of age had touched him. But he went down into the catacombs and took his place with those others who were waiting and could still speak to him with their minds, so that he should not be quite alone with the silence. The years went by, leaving no traces of themselves in the unchanging gloom of the mortuary halls. One by one those last few minds were stilled until all were gone. And by that time age had chained him where he was unable to rise and go again into the city where he had been young, the youngest of all, Shannock, they had named him, the last. So he waited, alone. And only one who was kin to the mountains could have borne that waiting in the place of the dead. Then, in a burst of flame and thunder, new life came into the valley. Human life, soft, frail, receptive life, intelligent, unprotected, possessed of violent and bewildering passions. Very carefully, taking its time, the mind of Shawnock reached out and gathered them in. Some of the men were more violent than the others. Shawnock saw their emotions in patterns of scarlet against the dark of his inner mind. They had already made themselves masters, and a number of these frail sensitive brains had snapped out swiftly because of them. These I will take for my own, thought Shawnock. Their mind patterns are crude, but strong, and I am interested in death. There had been a surgeon aboard the ship, but he was dead. However, there was no need of a surgeon for what was about to be done. When Shawnock had finished talking to the men he had chosen, telling them of the sunstones, telling them the truth, but not all of it, when those men had eagerly agreed to the promise of power, Shawnock took complete control. And the clumsy convict hands that moved now with such exquisite skill were as much his instruments as the scalpels of the dead surgeon that they wielded, making the round incision and the delicate cutting of the bone. Who was the man that lay there, quiet under the knife? Who were the ones that bent above him, with the strange stones in their brows? Names. There are names, and I know them. Closer, closer. I know that man who lies there with blood between his eyes. Trevor screamed. Someone slapped him across the face, viciously and with intent. He screamed again, fighting, clawing, still blinded by the visions and the dark mists, and that voice that he dreaded so much spoke gently in his mind. It's all over, Trevor. It is done. The hand slapped him again, and a rough human voice said harshly, Wake up! Wake up, damn it! He woke. He was in the middle of a vast room, crouched down in the attitude of a fighter, shivering, sweating, 
his hands outstretched and grasping nothing. He must have sprung there, half unconscious, from the tumbled pallet of skins against the wall. Galt was watching him. "'Welcome, Earthman. How does it feel to be one of the masters?' Trevor stared at him. A burning flood of light fell through the tall window so high above his head, setting the sunstone ablaze between the Corin's sullen brows. Trevor's gaze fixed on that single point of brilliance. "'Oh, yes,' said Galt. "'It's true.' It struck Trevor with an ugly shock that Galt's lips had not moved, and that he had made no audible sound. "'The stones give us a limited ability,' Galt went on, still without speaking aloud. "'Not like his, of course. But we can control the hawks, and exchange ideas between us when we want to, if the range isn't too far. Naturally, our minds are open to him any time he wants to pry.' "'There is no pain,' Trevor whispered, desperately trying to make the thing not be so. "'My head doesn't ache.' "'Of course not. He takes care of that.' "'Shanak? If it isn't so, how do I know that name? And that dream, that endless nightmare in the catacombs?' Galt winced. "'We don't use that name. He doesn't like it.' He looked at Trevor. "'What's the matter, Earthman?' why so green? You were laughing once, remember? Where's your sense of humor now? He caught Trevor abruptly by the shoulders and turned him around so that he faced a great sheet of polished glassy substance set into the wall. A mirror for giants, reflecting the whole huge room, reflecting the small dwarf figures of the men. Go on, said Galt, pushing Trevor ahead of him. Take a look. Trevor shook off the Corin's grasp. He moved forward by himself, close to the mirror. He set his hands against the chill surface and stared at what he saw there. And it was true. Between his brows a sunstone winked and glittered. And his face, the familiar, normal, not-too-bad face he had been used to all his life, was transformed into something monstrous and unnatural a goblin mask with a third and evil eye. A coldness crept into his heart and bones. He backed away a little from the mirror, his hands moving blindly upward, slowly toward the stone that glistened between his brows. His mouth was twisted like a child's, and two tears rolled down his cheeks. His fingers touched the stone, and then the anger came. He sank his nails into his forehead, clawing at the hard stones, not caring if he died after he had torn it out. Galt watched him. His lips smiled, but his eyes were hateful. Blood ran down the sides of Trevor's nose. The sunstone was still there. He moaned and thrust his nails deeper, and Shannock let him go until he had produced one stab of agony that cut his head in two and nearly dropped him. Then Shannock sent in the full force of his mind. Not in anger, for he felt none, and not in cruelty, for he was no more cruel than the mountain he was kin to, but simply because it was necessary. Trevor felt that cold and lonely power roll down on him like an avalanche. He braced himself to meet it, but it broke his defenses, crushed them, made them nothing, and moved onward against the inmost citadel of his mind. In that reeling, darkened fortress all that was holy, Trevor crouched and clung to his armament of rage, remembering dimly that once, in a narrow canyon, it had driven back this enemy and broken free. And then some crude animal instinct far below the level of conscious thought warned him not to press the battle now, to bury his small weapon and wait letting this last redoubt of which he was yet master go untouched and perhaps unnoticed by his captor. Trevor let his hands drop limply and his mind go slack. The cold black tide of power paused, and then he felt it slide away, withdrawing from those threatened walls. Out of the edges of it, Shannock spoke. Your mind is tougher than these valley-bred Korans. They're well-conditioned, but you— you remember that you defied me once. The contact was imperfect then. 
it is not imperfect now remember that too trevor trevor drew in a long unsteady breath he whispered what do you want of me go and see the ship your mind tells me that it understands these things see if it can be made to fly again that order took trevor completely by surprise the ship but why shannock was not used to having his wishes questioned but he answered patiently i have still a while to live several of your short generations i have had too much of this valley too much of these catacombs i want to leave them trevor could understand that having had that nightmare glimpse into shannock's mind he could perfectly understand for one brief moment he was torn with pity for this trapped creature who was alone in the universe and then he wondered what would you do if you could leave the valley what would you do to another settlement of men who knows i have one thing left to me curiosity you'd take the corns with you and the hawks some they are my eyes and ears my hands and feet but you object trevor what difference does that make said trevor bitterly i'll go look at the ship come on said galt taking up an armful of torches i'll show you the way they went out through the tall door into the streets between the huge square empty houses the streets and houses that trevor had known in his dream remembering when they were lights and voices in them trevor noticed that only galt was leading him out of the opposite side of the city toward the part of the valley he had never visited and then his mind reverted to something that not even the shock of his awakening could drive out of his consciousness jen a sudden panic sprang up in him how long had it been since the darkness fell on him there in that catacomb long enough for almost anything to happen he envisioned jen being torn by hawks of her body lying dead as hughes had lain and he started to reach out for galt who had owned them both but abruptly shawnock spoke to him in that eerie silent way he was getting used to the woman is safe here look for yourself his mind was taken firmly and directed into a channel completely new to him he felt a curious small shock of contact and suddenly he was looking down from a point somewhere in the sky at a walled paddock with a number of tiny figures in it his own eyes would have seen them as just that but the eyes he was using now were keen as an eagle's though they saw no color but only black and white and the shadings in between so he recognized one of the distant figures as jen he wanted to get closer to her much closer and rather sulkily his point of vision began to circle down dropping lower and lower jen looked up he saw the shadow of wide wings sweep across her and realized that of course he was using one of the hawks he pulled it back so as not to frighten her but not before he had seen her face the frozen stoniness was gone and in its place had come the look of a wounded tigress i want her trevor said to shannock she belongs to galt i do not interfere galt shrugged you're welcome but keep her chained she's too dangerous now for anything but hawk meat the ship was not far beyond the city it lay canted over on its side just clear of a low spur jutting out from the barrier cliff it had hit hard and some of the main plates were buckled but from the outside the damage didn't seem irreparable if you had the knowledge and the tools to work with three hundred years ago it might have been made to fly again only those who had the knowledge and the will were dead and the convicts wanted to stay where they were the tough metal of the outer skin alloyed to resist friction that could burn up a meteor had stood up pretty well under three centuries of mercurian climate it was corroded and where the breaks were the inner shells were eaten through with rust but the hulk still remained the semblance of a ship will it fly asked shannock eagerly i don't know yet trevor answered galt lighted a torch and gave it to him i'll stay out here trevor laughed 
how are you ever going to fly over the mountains he'll see to that when the time comes galt muttered take the rest of these torches it's dark in there trevor climbed in through the gaping lock moving with great caution on the filled rust-red decks inside the ship was a shambles everything had been stripped out of it that could be used leaving only bare cubicles with the enamel peeling off the walls and a mouldering litter of junk in a locker forward of the airlock he found a number of space suits the fabric was rotted away but a few of the helmets were still good and some half score of oxygen bottles had survived the gas still in them shawnock urged him to go on patiently get to the essentials trevor the bridge room was still intact though the multiple thickness of glassite in the big port showed patterns of spidery cracks trevor examined the controls he was strictly a planetary spacer used to flying his small craft within spitting distance of the world he was prospecting and there were few gadgets here he didn't understand but he could figure the board well enough not far trevor only over the mountains i know from your mind and i remember from the minds of those who died after the landing and beyond the mountain wall there is a plain of dead rock more than a hundred of your reckoning in miles and then another ridge that seems solid but is not and beyond that pass there is a fertile valley twenty times bigger than corinth where earth men live only partly fertile and the mines that brought the earth men are pretty well worked out but a few ships still land there and a few earthmen still hang on that is best a small place to begin to begin what who can tell you don't understand trevor for centuries i've known exactly what i would do there is a kind of rebirth in not knowing trevor shivered and went back to studying the controls the wiring protected by layers of imperviplass insulation and conduit seemed to be in fair shape the generator room below had been knocked about but not too badly there were spare batteries corroded yes but if they were charged they could hold for a while will it fly i told you i don't know yet it would take a lot of work there are many slaves to do this work yes but without fuel it's all useless see if there's fuel the outlines of that hidden thing in trevor's secret mind were coming clearer now he didn't want to see them out in the full light where shawnock could see them too he thought hard about generators batteries and the hooking up of leads he crept among the dark bowels of the dead ship working toward the stern the torch made a red and smoky glare that lit up deserted wardrooms and plundered holds one large compartment had a heavy barred and bolted door that had bent like tin in the crash that's where they came from trevor thought like wolves out of a trap in the lower holds that had taken the worst of the impact were quantities of mining equipment and farm machinery all smashed beyond use but formidable looking none the less with rusty blades and teeth and queer hulking shapes they made him think of weapons and he let the thought grow adorning it with pictures of men going down under whirring reapers shawnock caught it weapons they could be used as such but the metal in them would repair the hull he found the fuel bunkers the main supply was used to the last grain of fissionable dust but the emergency bunker still showed some content on the mechanical gauges not much but enough End of section 17